This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 40 We was feeling pretty good after breakfast, and took my canoe and went over the river a-fishing, with a lunch, and had a good time, and took a look at the raft and found her all right, and got home late to supper, and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end they was standing on, and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper, and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was, and never let on a word about the new letter, but didn't need to, because we knowed as much about it as anybody did and as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned we slid for the cellar cupboard and loaded up a good lunch and took it up to our room and went to bed and got up about half past eleven and tom put on aunt sally's dress that he stole and was going to start with the lunch but says where's the butter i laid out a hunk of it i says on a piece of a corn bone well you left it laid out then it ain't here we can get along without it i says we can get along with it too he says just you slide down cellar and fetch it and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along i'll go and stuff the straw into jim's clothes to represent his mother in disguise and be ready to buy like a sheep and shove soon as you get there so out he went and down cellar went i the hunk of butter, big as a person's fist, was where I had left it, so I took up the slab of corn pone with it on, and blowed out my light, and started upstairs very stealthy, and got up to the main floor all right. But here comes Aunt Sally with a candle, and I clapped the truck in my hat, and clapped my hat on my head, and the next second she see me, and she says, "'You been down cellar?' "'Yes, am what you been doing down there nothing nothing no em. well then what possessed you to go down there this time of night i i don't know em. you don't know don't answer me that way tom i want to know what you been doing down there i ain't been doing a single thing aunt sally i hope to gracious if i have i reckon she'd let me go now and as a general thing, she would, but I suppose there were so many strange things going on she just in a sweat about every little thing that weren't yardstick straight. So she says, very decided, "'You just march into that settin' room and stay there till I come. You've been up to something you've no business to, and I lay I'll find out what it is before I'm done with you.' So she went away as I opened the door and walked into the settin' room my but there was a crowd there fifteen farmers and every one of them had a gun i was most powerful sick and slunk to a chair and sat down they was settin around some of them talkin a little in a low voice and all of them fidgety and uneasy but trying to look like they weren't but i knowed they was because they was always takin off their hats and puttin them on and scratchin their heads and changing their seats and fumbling with their buttons i warn't easy myself but i didn't take my hat off all the same i did wish aunt sally would come and get done with me and lick me if she wanted to and let me get away and tell tom how we'd overdone this thing and what a thundering hornet's nest we'd a got ourselves into so we could stop fooling around straight off and clear out with jim before these rips got out of the patience and come for us at last she come and begun to ask me questions, but I couldn't answer them straight. I didn't know which end of me was up, because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wantin' to start right now and lay for them desperados, and saying it warn't but a few minutes to midnight, and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the sheep signal, and here was Auntie pecking away at the questions and me a shaking all over and ready to sink down in my tracks i was that scared and the place getting hotter and hotter and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears 
and pretty soon when one of them says, I'm for going and getting in the cabin first and right now and catching them when they come. I most dropped, and a streak of butter come a-trickling down my forehead, and Aunt Sally she see it and turns white as a sheet and says, For the land's sake, what is the matter with the child? He's got the brain fever as sure as you're born, and they're oozing out. And everybody runs to see and she snatches off my hat, and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter, and she grabbed me and hugged me and says, Oh, what a turn you did give me, and how glad and grateful I am it ain't no worse, for luck's against us, and it never rains but it pours, and when I see that truck I thought we'd lost you, for I knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if— dear dear why didn't you tell me that was what you been down there for i wouldn't a cared now clear out to bed and don't let me see no more you till morning i was upstairs in a second and down the lightning rod in another one and shinning through the dark for the lean-to i couldn't hardly get my words out i was so anxious but i told tom as quick as i could we must jump for it now and not a minute to lose the house was full of men yonder with guns his eyes just blazed and he says no is that so ain't it bully why huck if it was to do over again i bet i could fetch two hundred if we could put it off till hurry hurry i says where's jim right at your elbow if you reach out your arm you can touch him he's dressed and everything's ready now we'll slide out and give the sheep signal but then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door and heard them beginning to fumble with the padlock and heard a man say i told you we'd be too soon they haven't come the door is locked here i'll lock some of you into the cabin you lay for em in the dark and kill em when they come and the rest scatter round a piece and listen if you can hear em coming so in they come but couldn't see us in the dark, and most trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft, Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and heard trampings close by outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there and put his eye to the crack. But couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps are scraping around out there all the time, and at last he nudged us and we slid out, and stooped down, not breathing, and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy towards the fence and engine file and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it. But Tom's britches catch fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he hear the steps coming, so he had a pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise, and as he dropped in our tracks and started, somebody sings out, Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot. But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved. Then there was a rush and a bang 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed around us we heard them sing out here they are they broke for the river after em boys and turn loose the dogs so here they come full tilt we could hear them because they wore boots and yelled but we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell we was in the path to the mill and when they got pretty close on to us we dodged into the bush and let them go by and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up, so they wouldn't scare off the robbers. But by this time somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making pow-wow enough for a million. But they was our dogs, so we stopped in our tracks till they catched up. And when they see it weren't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said, Howdy, and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering, and then we up steam again and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied 
and hopped in and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river, but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out, easy and comfortable, for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank, till we was so far away the sounds got dim and died out. And when we stepped on to the raft I says, "'Now, old Jim, you're a free man again, and I bet you won't ever be a slave no more.' And a mighty good job it was, too, Huck. It is plan beautiful, and it was done beautiful, and they ain't nobody can get up a plan that's more mixed up and splendid than what dat one was. We was all glad as we could be, but Tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg. When me and Jim heard that, we didn't feel so brash as what we did before. It was hurting him considerable, and bleeding, so we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of the duke's shirts for uh, to bandage him, but he says, "'Give me the rags. I can do it myself. Don't stop now. Don't fool around here, and the evasion boobin' along so handsome. Man the sweeps, and set her loose. Boys, we done it elegant. Deed we did. I wish we'd a had the handling of Louis sixteen, and there wouldn't have been no son of St. Louis, ascend to heaven, wrote down in his biography. No, sir, we'd a whooped him over the border. That's what we'd a done with him, and done it just as slick as nothing at all, too. Man the sweeps! Man the sweeps! But me and Jim was consulting, and thinking, and after we'd thought a minute, I says, Say it, Jim. So he says, Well, then, this is the way it looked to me, Huck. If it was him that has been sought free, and one of the boys was to get shot, would he say, Go on and save me, never mind about a doctor for to save this one? Is dat like Mars Tom Sawyer? Would he say dat? You bet he wouldn't. Well, then, is Jim going to say it? No, sir, I don't budge a step out in this place without a doctor, not if it's forty year. I knowed he was white inside, and I reckon he'd say what he did say. So it was all right now, and I told Tom I was a-goin' for a doctor. He raised considerable row about it, but me and Jim stuck to it, and wouldn't budge. So he was for crawlin' out and settin' the raft loose hisself, but we wouldn't let him. Then he give us a piece of his mind, but it didn't do no good. So when he sees me getting the canoe ready, he says, "'Well, then, if you're bound to go, I'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village. Shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast, and make him swear to be silent as the grave, and put a purse full of gold in his hand, and then take and lead him all around the back alleys and everywheres in the dark, and then fetch him here in the canoe, in a roundabout way amongst the islands.' and search him and take his chalk away from him, and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village, or else he will chalk this raft so he can find it again. It's the way they all do. So I said I would, and left, and Jim was to hide in the woods when he see the doctor coming, till he was gone again. End of chapter